Hello and welcome to Series 3 of Greenbelt's Somewhere to Believe in podcast. In this series, a nun, a rabbi, a Muslim convert, a Lutheran firebrand, a humanist, an American liberation theologian, a retired Met police officer and an LGBTQ priest all walk into a bar. You know they always say don't talk about religion or politics. Well, funny that because that's what we like to talk about most at Greenbelt. Perhaps that makes us in for life. Find out and join us in this series of no holds barred conversations with extraordinary people who are prepared to wear their hearts on their rolled up sleeves, for whom faith isn't personal, who get stuck in because of what they believe. Hi Paul. Hi Catherine, we're back again. We are you know what I realised? It has been a year since we started this. I think a year this week was the first time we set up our microphones and had a go at this. Do you remember when we used to do those little practice runs? And um, I was still living in a, a caravan at the time in, in the garden. And you had sort of not, not all that long been living in your, your new flat. And uh, we would do these practice runs where we would sort of like try and waffle on about something. And then we'd listen back through to it and think, oh, no, we're rubbish at this. <laughs> 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 I'd love to listen to those again. I think I deleted them for the sake of humanity in general. Yeah, that's um, fair. I took a fo- when we first started. I took a photo of me in this like duvet den that I made in my kitchen, and it just popped up saying, "This is one year ago." I remember we tried all sorts of different little microphones that we had that we record the talks uh, through at Green Belt, and then we realised they didn't sound very good. And we, you know, we we played around with lots of different combinations, didn't we? But the duvets have been been absolutely key, haven't they? <laughs> they have, they have. Yeah, if anyone wants to know about the the best tog duvet for home recording, just uh, email in, and we'll we'll let you into our trade secrets. But it, in some ways, it feels like Groundhog Day, doesn't it? We're still. Um, living with the effects of the pandemic and various forms of lockdown and restrictions. And the, the latest thing is that the government is now anxious about whether or not we should fully open up. And on step four day, 21st of June, which has always been billed as Freedom Day in certain parts of the press. What, what do you think about that, Catherine? It's a bit heartbreaking, isn't it? Because I feel like we're so close. We're so We were so close to tasting that bit of normality that I think we were all needing after this last year and now it seems like that might be slipping away it's a hard thing to deal with really isn't it it is isn't it It, you know obviously it's very tough for the government to make the right call it's very tough for us as a as a citizenship you know as a population to deal with it psychologically because even though we've all been told it's all about the data and not the dates because there were those dates there it's understandable that we were all looking to the dates and thinking oh yeah 21st of june here we go well fingers crossed nothing's nothing's mentioned yet let's hope let's keep hoping that this summer is going to be the summer that we all need and obviously we've got we've got a plan that i think is looking that we're going to be able to go ahead and do that's looking I'm very confident about being able to get go ahead and do that at the end of August. Yeah, you're talking about Prospect Farm, our camping I gatherings. I am, oh, yes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, here's what I'm really looking forward to. Here's what I am, like, I have my eyes set on this experience. Yeah. I want to turn up on site and unpack my van and then I want to head to the Jesus Arms type bar that we're having and I want to see all those familiar faces that I haven't seen for a couple of years, all those green belters and I want to sit there and I want to have a pint and I want to listen to some bands and I want to dance and I want to have fun that's what I'm looking forward to the most, that's what I'm desperate for (laughs) (laughs) We're doing this all for you Catherine (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> what are you most looking forward to? Well, my my expectations and uh, would be almost identical to yours. <laughs> Uh, yeah, it's about it's about being in that space with those people who I consider to be pretty much my primary community, for want of a better phrase. You know, they're the people who keep me going, who give me inspiration, who I, in a sense, I almost feel accountable to. I like to check in with them. And I missed it last year, missed it massively. So for me, it's just about being in the same place with those people. Sounds pretty good for this year, doesn't it? Yeah, it sounds perfect. Yeah. Sounds so come perfect. and join us. Come and join us. Okay, so I think we ought to um, cut to the chase and introduce our special guest for this week. 
Who are we talking to this week? This week we're talking to Yvonne Ridley. Um, she's a fantastic woman, journalist, activist. She's got a fascinating story and she seems to have lived about nine different lives. And Yeah, and we didn't have like a firm Greenbelt connection or an in uh, to Yvonne, but we, we've we read about her quite often. And I, I've, I remember particularly an aspect of her life that she'll talk about at the beginning of our conversation. I remember that being in the press and I was just amazed. And I thought, you know, should we give it a pitch? Should we just you know go out to her with an invite and she responded straight away saying oh i'd love to be part of your podcast greenbelt sounds wonderful so we got the privilege of sitting down with yvonne and chatting to her uh, a few months ago just to let listeners know there is a bit right at the end of the podcast that i think that we ju- you just need to we just need to give a bit of a warning there's some th- stories and some things that are a bit upsetting again really important to listen to but just go into this podcast knowing that Yeah, and as well as some hard-hitting material, there is also, on a more light-hearted note, Yvonne is talking to us from her small holding uh, on the Scottish borders, and there are a lot of animals um, in the background, some of whom you will hear from time to time. Yeah, so please write in if you can identify those animals, and uh, (laughs) we'll give you a shout-out on the next podcast. (laughs) (laughs) Hi Yvonne, thank you so much for for joining us. Where are are you speaking to us from today? Uh, From the Scottish borders. And that's where you've got a small holding there, is that right? That's right, yes. I keep um, sheep and goats and a few hens, rescue hens, and uh, quite an an odd assortment of uh, animals, peacocks and peahens. Yes. (laughs) Yes. <laughs> and, and lots of bees, is that right? Um, I'm down to one hive. Unfortunately, we had two colony failures last year. So, yes, I've got uh, one hive of uh, Welsh bees that are uh, quite active today. It's quite a jolly day today. That sounds heavenly. Yeah. I mean, you've got a fascinating story and I feel like there's so much to talk about. Um, And I know that our audience can go and read a lot about um, your story, your time that you spent in Afghanistan. But maybe we should just cover that a little bit because it's so Mm. interesting. I think I think it it kind of is a good starting place. Um, Do you want to talk to us about your career in journalism and how that took you to Afghanistan? Yes, well, I was the, it's coming up to the 20th anniversary, actually, we're just a few months away from it. But I was the chief reporter of the Sunday Express. The world was still reeling after the horrific events of 9-11. And the drums of war were beating very loudly in the direction of Afghanistan, which at that time uh, was... Uh, where Osama bin Laden was based. Uh, Remember him, (laughs) the Al-Qaeda leader. And uh, America wanted the ruling Taliban government in Afghanistan to hand him over because uh, he was the number one suspect, um, the mastermind behind the 9-11 atrocity. And I was sent out to Pakistan, uh, where about 3,000 other journalists from around the world were assembled on the border waiting for the war to start. And I uh, guessed it's going to take about two to three weeks to mobilise an army, get into a position where you're ready to uh, start a war. So I thought in the meantime, I would try and get into Afghanistan and talk to ordinary people, try and put a human face on who we were going to go to war with and and try and, and speak to ordinary Afghans about their hopes and fears. So I sneaked into the country wearing the all-enveloping blue burqa and uh, with a couple of guides and moved around quite freely for two days and then I headed back. But unfortunately, I was uh, arrested by the Taliban 
and held for 11 terrifying days by some scary-looking men who George Bush and Tony Blair had told us were the most brutal, evil regime in the world and that they hated women. So I didn't think my chances of surviving one night, never mind two or three, um, you know, every every night, in fact, I'd think, is this my last night on earth? Every morning, um, I would think, is this my last day? And it, it really was terrifying. But the truth is, they never laid a finger on me. The only threat that they made was if I didn't cooperate with them, I would spend 20 or more years in prison. And it was still a terrifying experience. And when people asked me, how were you treated? I told the truth. And you think it's very easy to tell the truth, but people were furious because if you're about to bomb a country, you don't want to have to bomb nice people. And so when I said I'd been treated with courtesy and respect, um, a lot of questions followed. Well, hold on, you know, we thought they were evil. We thought they were brutal. Why have they released you? Uh, they released me on humanitarian grounds. The wave of anger that I met and encountered after I left Afghanistan was quite astonishing because people didn't want to know anything at all positive about um, the perceived enemy. I had given them an undertaking uh, that I would study Islam and read the Quran. Um, in truth, I would have promised them anything just to get out of that terrifying situation. And um, I started to read the Quran. It was very easy for me because I was already a practicing Christian. So I had that core belief in God. And to my astonishment, as I started reading the Quran, there were all the prophets and personalities that um, I'd already encountered reading the Bible. We actually have so much in common. And after two years, I decided to embrace Islam uh, just for me. Uh, embracing Islam was a natural progression. I still have the utmost respect for Christianity, if not more in, in many ways. I don't feel as though I've gone off and joined some far-flung religion at all. My mother said, well, I just don't know why you've got involved in this foreign religion. And I said, where do you think Jesus comes from? <laughs> Manchester. <laughs> Did you, um, around that time before you went into Afghanistan, it feels like you might have, um, did you go in neutral or did you go in with this perception that was being sold to us at the time that the war was just and these people, we needed to go in and defend our, our honour and ourselves? I swallowed the propaganda hook, line and sinker. And of course, it all happened so quickly um, I think it it happened within about 26, 27 days of 9-11 happening, which is, you know, a very small time frame. And so people didn't have time to look at the history of Afghanistan, look at the recent history, look at the history going back over the, the centuries, and I'm not sure why we continue to do this, but if only we would look back at history and learn from it, uh, we would never have put any soldiers, American, British, or any other nations, into that country. There's a lot of blood in the soil of Afghanistan. You have to think, gosh, 20 years of war, what was that all about? And... I get really upset when people say, oh, well, it, it was about the liberation of women, because it wasn't. There are very few career women emerging from the rubble of Afghanistan today. There are a few, 
Um, and there are a few success stories, but uh, on the whole, the country is broken and fractured. And I remember when I, uh, about four or five years ago, when I was in a little village in the Gardez district, and speaking to a woman and uh, through a translator, and she basically said she was fed up of um, Western NGOs and charities trying to rescue her. And she said, if the West really wants to help, do something about him. And she pointed at her husband sitting in the corner and she said, get him a job. Let him get his dignity back. Let him earn some money so he can put bread on the table. And, you know, that that really resonated with me. And from all the war zones that I've been in, from uh, Syria, Iraq, Jordan, uh, Darfur in Africa, uh, all women want exactly the same, and that is security, food on the table for them and their children, education, and a a good health um, service around them. And that's not a great deal to ask. And when you think about it, if we spent money on getting security, on getting a good welfare system, on getting a good education and a good health system in place, instead of spending billions on bullets and bombs, you know, wouldn't the world be a much kinder place? Which makes me feel that, you know, women need to step up to the plate and play a role in the political landscape of their country, whether it's here in Britain, whether it's in Africa, whether it's in the Middle East, you know, wherever we are, because... As I keep reminding people, women are half the population and we gave birth to the other half. So involve us in the decision making, please. From from that early experience in the millennium, you then got very involved in the broader anti-war movement and Mm. presumably you as were were many others listening to this podcast perhaps were part of that huge march in london ahead of the invasion of iraq um yes i I, catherine and i were talking um this morning about chatting with you and we were thinking you know what did we achieve what was that all about because it feels like it didn't make any difference how do you feel about those sorts of you know, when there seems to be such a groundswell of public opinion that seems to not count for anything. That that was um, just an incredibly sad time when the war in Iraq started because of all the efforts of ordinary people who were so, you know, many were so demotivated by what happened. And... I think it was a test of our faiths, a test of our beliefs, um, a test of our understanding of what democracy is. It it was um, it shook a lot of people so much so that people still find it very difficult to forget. I had joined the Labour Party as a teenager, and. I had to tear up my membership in 2003 when the war started because I think there was the vast march in London but throughout the country as well. Um, I think altogether there must have been two to three million people marching right throughout the UK, from Northern Ireland, Ireland, uh, Wales, Scotland, uh, throughout England, and of course that incredible gathering in London. And I think it affected one in ten households were 
against that war. And there was our democratically elected leader on a, a path that he would not be dissuaded from. And of course, we now know in the aftermath of um, various inquiries that there were no WMD, um, as many had said, as weapons inspectors had said, there were no WMD and, and uh, more than a million widows and orphans were created. And out of the ashes of Iraq rose this heinous organization, ISIS, the Islamic State. I hate to use the word Islam, but that's what they called themselves. They had the audacity to call themselves the Islamic State. As a result of their actions, I started to read into Islam more, thinking, have I made a mistake? You know, how can these people say that uh, they're Islamic because I, I'm a member of the same faith, but I don't recognize what they're doing? And of course, what they were doing had nothing to do with Islam, and, and uh, they had a a warped, twisted interpretation. But we've seen it with many religious cults. You get, um, and it is predominantly men, you'll get men who will want to control, manipulate, and they will take religious texts, and before you know it, um, you know, they'll get followers uh, who are gullible and, and looking for something, um, and they swallow these uh, these the, these narratives that are bear no relation to the faith, and we've seen it in in all all faiths. It, it really is um, shocking, and I despair when I, especially for the the Christian uh, population in Iraq which was, um, you know, a thriving, flourishing uh, population. In it. Um, and I'm not promoting Saddam, but his deputy was a Christian. You know, Christians weren't persecuted or hidden away in Iraq, but they are today. And it, it's so sad. You know, it's very important that uh, while following our own faith, that we give support to other faiths as well and and um, focus on, on what does unite us rather than what divides us. And we should protect each other. I was in Tahrir Square during the height of the Egyptian revolution and one of the most heartwarming scenes I saw was um, on a Friday during Friday prayers where Muslims gathered to pray and uh, members of the Coptic Christian community in Cairo surrounded the um, Muslims so that we could pray in safety. And there we were praying in Tahrir Square, being protected by Christians and that, it, you know, the hair still stands on the back of my neck thinking about that. You know, I wonder if if there is such a connection, if there is just so much of this stuff that we have in common, where did these stories come from about Islam? Do you think that the media might have some responsibility about that? Or, you know, where did that come from? I think that... Um... The rise of the far right uh, across the world has helped contribute to it. Um, the influence of the far right um, and some of the right wing media as well. Over the last 20 years, we've had some outrageous stories that haven't even had a grain of truth. But it's only when people are starting to challenge them now 
that um, we're getting apologies in the paper. I'm sick of reading every November, December, uh, Muslims ban Christmas. Uh, the truth is a lot of Muslims actually, you know, who doesn't like a holiday? <laughs> who doesn't like a celebration? It's um, it's so sad that there is this mischief making out there. And I'm not saying Muslims aren't blameless, you know, um, because they feel under pressure. Um, a few of them do withdraw into what I call an Islamic bubble. Well, that isn't what Islam is about. If that's purely what Islam was about, it never would have left the Arabian Peninsula. There has undoubtedly been, amongst a very, very small minority, a radicalization of people's understanding of their faith, whether they're Muslims or Christians or Jews. Mm. There has been a playing out of um, a certain type, a thread of radicalization. And I think at Greenbelt, we look at that with a great deal of um, sorrow, really, because mm -hmm. our take is that if you're a believer, if you're an adherent to a faith, that faith is going to make you radical in some senses. Um, radical that needn't be a bad word, but and yet Thank you. I think that you know, <laughs> uh, I think you know we we look at your life, for instance. You know, while we were prepping for this reading about all you've done, and we would say there is a radical, and but it seems like we're not allowed to use that word anymore because it's bad. It's about radicalization. No. It's about violence. I'll take it as a compliment. I mean, one of my favourite sayings is. Um, if you're not radicalized, you haven't been paying attention. And going on to politics, I mean, I became radicalized by the policies of Margaret Thatcher. And, and I would say that turned me into a, a radical person. But I've, I go out and speak into the Muslim community and I say, don't be afraid of um of your you know of saying yes i am a practicing muslim yes i do pray five times a day that doesn't make me an extremist and this drive this word moderate i hate it um and the, the way i explain it is you know um for the parents among us, when you go to a parent teacher's night and you're sitting there, you want to hear how well your child is performing, how they're extremely good at this and, and top of the class. At the, this, is the, this is what you want to hear. You might not get that, <laughs> but that's what you want to hear. What you don't want to hear is, oh, yes, your child's a moderate student. Um, he's doing uh, moderately well in maths. Um, he's moderately okay in, in biology, you know. And so what does that make a moderate Muslim? Moderate is the wrong word. It suggests that there's something wrong with uh, the original belief. We touched a little bit on your radicalization and your political career, because obviously um, during the uh, the campaign in the anti-war movement, you did step into the political arena for a little mm -hmm. while, didn't you? Can you tell yes. us a little bit about what inspired that and why you might have left that and how that was? You know, I'd been in the Labour Party for so long and I just looked at the politicians and I thought you're not doing a good job. And I'd, of course, we we can all be critical and, and it's our right to, to be critical as well. But there's nothing worse than somebody moaning without coming up with a solution. You know, as I say, <laughs> keep saying to different people, don't give me problems, give me solutions. And so I just thought, um, gosh, I could do a better job than that. Well, why don't you? Well, yes, you're right. I should give it a go. So I got into the, um, I'd left the, the, the Labour Party and there was nowhere for someone with my socialist beliefs to go. And then the Respect Party was formed and it was a heroic little party. I think it would have done very well in today's climate. I think it was ahead of its time. 
and it went tearing off at a, a race of knots. We fielded candidates in every single seat in Britain for the for the European elections. Uh, we had amazing people like the uh, award-winning film director Ken Loach, uh, George Monbiot, the uh, great environmentalist, and and we had all sorts of amazing people of all faiths and none, and it was really reflective of um, multicultural Britain. But uh, as fast as it took off, um, it unfortunately um, had well a meteoric rise, I would say, and and meteors are dead stars and what goes up comes down and unfortunately um, because of various internal problems it it failed. I left respect when I heard about Scottish independence and so I moved to Scotland in 2011-2012 to um, become active in the independence movement in Scotland and I worked quite solidly on that. And then I joined the SNP, which at that time was the only political party um, that was promoting independence. And just last week, um, I have uh, left the SNP and I've joined one of these fledgling uh independent parties um, and uh, that is um, that's called Action for Independence or AFI for short and there's something really exciting about grassroots politics and activism and there's an amazing movement in Scotland uh, which is a broad church of all politics and none and it's called All Under One Banner. And their saying is everyone first. And I just think that's such a brilliant saying, everyone first. On your website, it says the thing that you're most proud of in terms of your activism is when you were on the boats into Gaza in 2008. Oh. And mm -hmm. as a festival, we've got a long-standing interest in and connection with uh, the Palestinian people. Um, we're mm -hmm. deeply connected with lots of creative projects and partner projects there. Um, we'd be really interested to hear from you. Why, why is that one thing, you know, something you're so proud, fond of, you know, uh, feel was really important? We'd, we'd love to hear a bit more about that. I think when something takes a lot of hard work and a lot of effort, um, it becomes so much more valuable. And getting a boat to Gaza, it involved a lot of fundraising. It brought together more than 30 different nationalities and um, a diverse group of activists the decision making was all made by consensus so you could get 39 people agreeing and if one said no um, you couldn't move forward and I found that quite frustrating but it taught me to understand that everybody counts that project was all about raising awareness because people forget Gaza is on the Mediterranean Sea and it's closer to Europe than a lot of people realize you know and these waters that the Palestinians are fishing in are being fished in by the French the Spanish uh, the, the Greeks uh, the Turks you know the, this and yet the Palestinians ha it going out to catch fish can cost them their lives and I started looking at the siege of Gaza as well. Now people think, again, that's just a few years old. When we sailed into Gaza, we were the first boat in four, more than 42 years to actually sail into the port of Gaza. 
And that's why we, when we got there, 150,000 Palestinians were waiting for us and cheering for us. And, uh, you know, they couldn't believe their eyes. We couldn't believe it either because just a few hours earlier, we had been surrounded by Israeli gunboats. Our communications were electronically jammed. Our mobile phones went down. Everything, you know, just went down. And there we were bobbing in the, uh, the Mediterranean in pitch black. So by the time we did get into the harbour at Gaza, it was just an incredible experience. A few more boats followed us after that. Um, and then, sadly, we had uh, the flotilla, the most ambitious sailing to Gaza, and uh, we had the Marvi Marmara, a Turkish boat, that was um, attacked by Israeli commandos and more than 10 people, um, Turkish people died. It was a tragedy. In terms of your view of Palestine, Israel, and um, I know that w with certainly as respect was a very strongly anti-Zionist party. Mm -hmm. Where do you stand on Zionism? What does, what does Zionism mean to you? And, and therefore, what does it mean for the way that you think about the state of Israel? Well, I think Zionism, it, it's a political ideology. And I am able to separate um, Zionism from Judaism. And I think that uh, like any political ideology, you should be able to criticise it freely so I am quite comfortable with the fact of being quite critical of Zionism. I would never criticise Judaism. I've got huge respect uh, for all faiths. There are a lot of really good people in Israel who want to see peace. In fact, every, I think the majority of people want to see peace. And I think that the only way that that is going to be achieved is by bringing both sides down to the table to talk. And I don't think we can leave it to the politicians. I think it's got to come through grassroots movements and organisations. The two-state solution, in, in my view, uh, has gone. It, it, it's You look and it, it's impossible. Um, so what's left? One state, one people coming together um, with equal rights and, and uh, being treated equally. There are a growing number of young Jews on university campuses now who um, are beginning to question Zionism. And, you know, a hundred years ago, I think, Zionists were not even 10% of the Jewish population, of the world's Jewish population. It's grown. I think it's um, reached a stage where it's, it's past its sell-by date. Reading through your life, um, it, it's it's completely fascinating and the, and the activism that you've been involved with is... Uh, I mean, you've seemed rest, like relentless and restless with it, which is fantastic. How do you, but there, there hasn't been a lot of, I guess, ideal solutions to any of those things. How do you keep going when things might not be going in the direction that you had been fighting for? Finding hope. And I'm so glad you asked that question because, um, Having travelled through Palestine um, and and uh, spoken with people in Gaza, spoken with to people in the occupied West Bank and Janine and and uh, Ramallah, from ordinary, you know, just the little kids in the street uh, through to the politicians, they all have hope. Wherever there's hope, I think that you can 
energize from that. Now, there are two areas where I have been absolutely distraught and um, and one was visiting the refugee camps of the Rohingya people in um, in Bangladesh. And I went there after about 750,000 Rohingya fled for their lives from neighbouring Myanmar into the uh, refugee camps in Bangladesh. And what really destroyed me inside was that there was no hope. You know, what must it take somebody to abandon their home, their worldly goods, their pots and pans and paintings and whatever possessions they've got to run out of the house and and be on foot fleeing for seven days and then end up in a plastic bamboo shelter. And when you say, where would you rather be? They say here. Then the shortly after I'd been to Bangladesh, I went and, and traveled to Syria in the so-called free area um, there are lots of uh, hope there where people are determined to rebuild their lives. And, and uh, But then I went into Turkey and, and spoke to some of the women who'd been held in the regime's prisons, who had been raped and abused and, and raped on an industrial scale. And that was so distressing because they had had uh, the hope just removed. They were existing. This is, um, you know, this really does uh, does have an impact. But um, on the whole, in in the war zones that I've visited, um, hope springs eternal. And wherever there is hope, um, in the people, you know, you you can see that um, there's something to work towards. We are in very challenging times, but we can't give up. And and um, we have a responsibility, I feel, as human beings to do what we can to give each other a, a helping hand. And I think in this fast-moving world of social media and short tempers and outbursts, we've got to be kinder to each other. And that is something all our faiths teach us. And we've enjoyed hearing your peacocks in the background as well. <laughs> yes, <laughs> noisy blighters. They're, um, it's the, the mating season. <laughs> ah. <laughs> Um, perhaps one day, Yvonne, when um, the pandemic is, um, when we've got to grips with it a little bit more, we'd love to perhaps invite you to the festival if you would come. Um, I would love to come. I really would. I would love that. Wonderful. Thank you so much for your time, Yvonne. We've we've loved we've loved talking. I've loved it. You know, it's, you've you're great. Really, I feel so relaxed now. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> good. <laughs> GMTV are looking for some good presenters. <laughs> I, I, I sometimes wonder how people, uh, you know, who've survived a, a Piers Morgan monstering, uh, how long it takes them to recover. But I feel great and relaxed, so thank you very much. <laughs> So another really fascinating guest. Incredible story. I love the fact that she sounded so gentle and unassuming. I know I know exactly what you mean. It's like she could be your your friend, your neighbour, your mother, but has had this amazing life. Yeah. Terrifying and fascinating and powerful and like, you know, world changing life. And yet she just seems like people that I know in my life. She seemed to hold things quite lightly in, in a way, which I think is a real good skill to have in life. It's, it's, it's odd because it, it brought it put me right back into that time that we, you know, 9-11 and the Taliban and weapons of mass 
destruction and it took me right back to that moment do you remember do you remember what you were feeling and where you were when we when that war started i remember when the skyscrapers were hit when the twin towers were hit i remember that morning because i think it was like nine o'clock ish in the morning on on, um the 11th of september 2001 and i remember I do remember that morning very, very vividly and just being completely transfixed and glued to watching the news on TV. Um, And I remember then a very, very powerful narrative and story built very, very quickly about um, the the source of where this complete evil... uh, And don't get me wrong, that that act of terror was an atrocity at, on a on a massive scale. It was absolutely shocking, outrageous. But the story that built then very, very quickly, uh, the consensus and the story that built was felt even more powerful that we had to do something about this absolute resident evil that had taken taken up occupation in in our world and we had to go and root it out at all costs do you how did you feel do you remember those times i think i was about 14 15 years old and then that story and that narrative really fed through to you know for me growing up that's that's the world that i really grew up in and i remember feeling that there was these um barbaric inhumane group of people that were coming and threatening my life my world that i needed to be fearful of um and that they were could quite easily bomb our countries that they would kidnap people that they would cut off their heads that there was just this like almost kind of cartoon like story about evil just pure evil coming in and that we're going to destroy everything that I loved and knew. Just think about the fallout from that that, that event and then the, the narrative that built around that event and all that has flowed from that. I mean, Yvonne talked a lot about her sense of complete dismay and betrayal that um, the Labour Party, which she had been a lifelong member of, um, took us into war against Saddam Hussein uh, in Iraq to get rid of what you've described already as these weapons of mass destruction, WMD. We all got to know that acronym, didn't we? And it, it reminded me what, what Yvonne was saying. Sometimes it's very difficult to tell and see the truth in the face of a dominant narrative. That was the reason that she went into Afghanistan before the war on terror was unleashed. Um, she wanted to find out uh, the truth, the facts on the ground for herself. And it makes you realise that it's never a bad thing to question, to ask questions about things and to be sceptical and to seek to know more. It's never a bad thing because sometimes, not always, but sometimes the stories that we are um, fed, uh, that we're asked to consume, uh, aren't the only stories that we should be paying attention to, I guess. That's what she, Yvonne made me ca- made me realize is that it's it's always good to keep your sort of like your antennae up and to be thinking what's what's going on here what what what's the truth here yeah these situations are normally very complicated and i can sense when anybody's trying to push a very simplified narrative on me that that's not how things work you know it's and i can understand why people do that it's to get us to simply react in a way that is necessary and needed. Um, But things are rarely simple. Things are very colourful and have lots... You know, we should be able to have conversations and understand the complexities, but maybe maybe it's too much for our brains to be able to get around. (laughs) You know, when she was talking to women in all these war-torn countries you know they had a very simple set of needs of what they wanted which was stability which was food on the table which was access to education and healthcare. and what would have what would happen if we used all of that money that we spent destabilizing places and use money to give stability to places it's an interesting thought isn't it yeah yeah and it it sounds naive doesn't it on on the one hand but 
I think it's very powerful to think about that. And right now, you know, in the news, it's really big that that um, people are trying to challenge the government on the way that they've cut our international aid contribution right now. And obviously, yes, the, the public finances are under huge pressure because of COVID and the way that we've had to respond to COVID. It's been a very, very expensive time. But there is this sense in which it doesn't make any sense to cut international aid because if you cut international aid, all you're doing is you're just prolonging and developing problems which one day, um, you know, you will have to get involved in to help uh, make better in, in, one, in one way or another. Because we recorded this podcast a few weeks back, didn't we? And... Um... We talked to Yvonne a little bit about Gaza and um, her experience there and the situation there. And there's been so much happened in the last month, in the time that we recorded this podcast to now, haven't there? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And, you know, we didn't know what was going to flare up. But what we do know um, through our work with Greenbelt and our and our passions and our interests is that this isn't a short term issue. It's not something that's just blown up this summer. This is really long term. Yvonne described taking the boats in uh, to Gaza from the Mediterranean in 2008, uh, not long after the most, you know, the most recent and full blown blockade of Gaza has been uh, enacted uh, by the Israeli government. And you're thinking, wow, 2008 and things aren't any better. In fact, they're worse. I I think it made me realise that although there's now a quote unquote ceasefire um, between Israel and Hamas, um, you know, the easy thing is to think, oh, well, it's all gone away now. It's all better. But the, 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 the facts on the ground remain absolutely the same. Absolutely the same. You and I were on calls and, you know, belong to a WhatsApp group where we're hearing tons of stuff that is still going on. Um, Yeah, I mean, for you this time, Catherine, how did it how did it feel? I felt extremely hopeless. I think, you know, very early on, we took a call with some people and some people that we know that living in Gaza, people like Malak Matar that we've tried to get to the festival before and we've got her artwork. She's a, she's a young artist and she, she, we were talking to her just as the first bombs were being dropped outside her house and she told us that this felt different this time. She didn't think she was going to survive it. And not only that, that the things that were being targeted, you know, people weren't just afraid of losing their life, which they were, their life, their home, their family, their children, all of that was at risk. But what was also at risk was the life around them that people had built, which is really difficult to do in Gaza. So the she's an artist and the one art supply store in the whole of Gaza had been bombed the night before and to build that art store in Gaza to get art supplies in is not the same as doing it in the UK it's difficult when that store gets blown up there's no art supplies for her to do her art anymore when the library gets blown up it's hard to get books into there you know it's 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 people's lives people's dreams people's work people's ounce of hope and little bit of happiness that they had been able to carve themselves out for themselves in a in a situation in a place that is unimaginably hard that had been destroyed yeah i think that that was a a really deeply concerning aspect is that sort of cultural targeting as well as just the um just the terror that was unleashed there was a a systematic targeting of cultural centers of of hope and excellence and uh, clive stafford smith who's a previous guest on the podcast he's been involved in raising money for a bookshop in the the main possibly only um uh, bookshop in gaza city that was destroyed as well in the bombings and you've got to think hold on an art shop was destroyed a bookshop was destroyed there was various cultural centers in uh, east jerusalem which have been uh, raised to the ground or burnt and you're thinking what's going on here what is going on here that um, the occupation and the conflict is reaching a stage where there's a deliberate targeting of cultural centers because i think you're right catherine those cultural centers often provide people with the last signs of hope and and ways of expression and creativity that um 
you know, we, we have had the privilege of going out to Palestine a few times. And one of the things Palestinians talk about that we meet with is, is this sort of this beautiful resistance, a resistance that comes through culture, through art, through creativity. It helps us to connect to people. You know, sometimes the political situation over there is difficult for people to really connect to or to really understand. But when you see a piece of artwork or you listen to a piece of music by a band that's played in there and you enjoy it and you like the musicians, there's a connection that's formed there um, that that I think is is a form of resistance. Amos Trust and um, some music people that we've been involved with through the Palestinian Music Expo, they are fundraising at the moment for a children's festival that they're helping to give funds to, to put on in Gaza, just to try and heal some of that trauma that those children have gone through the last few weeks. So if anybody's got, I've given some money, if anybody's got any any money or any support, then we'll put that link in the email and, and point people towards that. <laughs> One thing I think we, we ought to just reference is the fact that, you know, her surprising conversion to, to Islam, having been brought up uh, in a largely a Christian context, and, you know, she promised her captors that she would read the Quran, and she did, and she actually then converted to Islam and has become a Muslim, a practicing Muslim. She prays five a day, five times a day, etc., and a lot of what the work she, that she does is around countering negative and stereotypical impressions of of what Islam is all about and what it means to be a Muslim. And I found that really, really delightful. I love that story she said where, you know, why have you, when her parents or her family said, why have you adopted this strange foreign religion? And she said, well, <laughs> you know, who, do you think Jesus was an Englishman? <laughs> We ought to talk about Yvonne's books. Um, she's got uh, three incredible books that are out. Um, she, the one, uh, the, her oldest book, describes that whole story of being captured by the Taliban. Um, you know, it's been out nearly 20 years now, but it's a fascinating read. But she's also got a book which she published about five or six years ago, which is about the way that, well, it asks the question, does torture ever work? So some of that book and, and the content of that connects with uh, the work of Clive Stafford Smith and Reprieve and the, and the podcast that we did with him. Most recently, she's got a wonderful little book out. Uh, it's almost like a beginner's guide to Islam. So if you're curious about what it means to be a Muslim or, you know, what is Islam all about? What do, what do is, uh, Muslims really believe? Um, that's a, that's a, a book she's written deliberately for people who don't have a uh, a Muslim faith at all and they're not even thinking about converting to Islam but they just want to understand a bit more and I love the the subtitle of the book is called Don't Shoot the Messenger which is uh, makes me smile every time but What do you fancy sort of you know sometime in the future Catherine moving to a small holding getting a few he rescue hens do you, do you see yourself going in the way of Yvonne? A hundred percent yeah definitely <laughs> Definitely. Yeah, maybe she's got space for me. Maybe we'll get in touch with her. So I could go and work on a farm. You need to do it half and half. You know, half your year living with Sister Teresa in the monastery in Montserrat and then half your year living with Yvonne, helping her on the small holding. What a life. <laughs> I think that would be my perfect life, actually. That would be brilliant. <laughs> Fantastic. Fab, and who have we got um, next on uh, next week's episode? Next week, we're going, we're switching to someone completely different. We're going to be talking to an Orthodox rabbi, Rabbi Herschel Gluck. And he's been to the festival before, hasn't he? He has. Yeah, he came to the festival. He's a real gentle soul. Very, very Orthodox, ultra Orthodox. We really enjoyed chatting to him. Very gentle, very lovely and very smiley. Yeah. Very smiley. It's such a shame, listeners, that you can't see the when we're recording our conversations with our guests, um, we get to see them. And Rabbi Herschel definitely had a twinkle in his eye. We always like it when people uh, respond to the podcast to tell us what you're thinking. You can email us on stbi at greenbelt.org.uk. You can also let us know what you're thinking on social media. 
Our Twitter is at Greenbelt. Our Instagram is at Greenbelt Festival. And we're Greenbelt Festival on Facebook too. Yeah. And if you want to um, get notifications about the podcast coming out and get a bit more in depth, um, some links and references and resources, we do a Friday email uh, that you can sign up to greenbelt.org.uk forward slash podcast. We'd like to say a few thank yous to the people who help us make these podcasts. Thank you to Daisy Wedgarrett on the staff team who helps us produce this podcast. And thank you to Paul Truman again on the staff team who helps us frame the episode. And to Josh and Jake on our Recorded Talks uh, volunteer team. They help us edit this whole thing and put it together, make it sound half decent. So thank you very much to them. And one big thank you to Lee Baines from Lee Baines and the Glorifiers for the use of his track, which we use in our titles. Um, it's called I Can Change. And we are forever grateful to Lee Baines and the Glorifiers for everything they do. Yvonne told us we were pretty good at pretty good at podcasting, Paul. Well, we've been doing it for a year, as you said at the beginning, there, yeah, Catherine. And I, th- yeah, I just, I just think we're on the up. I'm waiting for a call. <laughs> I've got plenty of time across this summer. I could fill in if Philip Schofield is, you know, otherwise indisposed. You know, I'm there. <laughs> Maybe that will happen, Paul. Maybe that will happen. You've put that out there. Let's see what comes back. Okay. Yeah, I've put it out there. <laughs> There's been mass protests all over Facebook to get you back uh, on your guitar, singing songs around the campfire at Prospect Farm, singing some Eden Burnings classics, and I'm desperate to make that happen. Well, isn't that happening, Catherine? Isn't that mainly? <laughs> isn't that the main thing that's going to be? <laughs> I mean, I've, I'm on a furlough now, a flexible furlough, so I'm only working a day or so a week for Green Bar, and pretty much the rest of my time is just given up to uh, guitar practice and uh, vocal lessons Good. and things. Good, as it should be. <laughs>